Today's show brought to you by our friends at the Maryland Jockey Club. Want to let folks know about a special promo they've got cooking. Express Bet and First Bet customers can cash in on a $10 free bet on the Pimlico Mandatory Pick 6 payout on Sunday, July 4th. Customers who bet the Pick 6 with Express Bet or First Bet will get up to $10 back. Customers who bet $10 plus on the Pick 6 will get $10 back. Customers who bet less than 10 on the Rainbow Six will get their amount bet back. All refunds will be processed by 5 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday, July 6th. Details can be found at firstbet.com slash bet slash promotions or by logging into FirstBet or ExpressBet. Check it out. Welcome to the In the Money Players podcast. This is a special show for Independence Day, Sunday, July 4th, recording on July 3rd, brought to you by our friends at the Maryland Jockey Club in honor of this seven-figure force out in the Pimlico Pick 6 on Sunday. PTF here uh, out on Long Island, actually, getting ready to hop on a plane and, and fly out to L.A. doing the show from my dad's old office very happy to be joined by a man coming to us from the planet Texas, but not the not the usual man, but a man we're hearing more and more of on these airwaves. And, and people seem to like it because he does a fantastic job speaking, of course, about Nick Tamaro. Nick, how are things? Good morning, Pete. I'm doing great. It's uh, good to be with you. And yes, the planet Texas is certainly big enough for both JK and I. <laughs> Now, you, you said you had a late night last night uh, o- over at Sam Houston. What was going on over there? So I've been, you know, they, they're they track announcer, Chris Griffin, who actually joined me on a podcast back in March on this network, took the full-time job at Parks and uh, left Houston in April. And so they were they were track announcer lists for the quarter horse season, which began three weeks after the thoroughbred season ended. And so uh, the director of racing there, Frank Hoff, put together a schedule of different announcers. And he had John McGarry come in, Jonathan Horowitz, John Lees, um, Jessica Paquette the called the week. Exactly. All the Johns, right. Um, <laughs> sounds, <laughs> right. Sounds like a bad prostitute's play, right? Um, <laughs> as, as, as we say that. But this is the content people tune in for. That's um, right. That's right. Yeah. This sounds like a normal conversation between Pete and I, so we're going to keep it that way. But um, – so, yeah, all the Johns plus Jessica Paquette. I guess I was the only person who called races whose name didn't start with a J, actually. <laughs> and uh, so so then after that 20, you know, 18, 19, 20 day season was over, the quarter horse dates from Ritama uh, in San Antonio were transferred to Sam Houston because Ritama took on quite a beating in the winter storm that we had here in February and had a bunch of pipes burst and some drywall issues. And they just weren't going to have everything done because obviously construction is at you know, not at a standstill, but materials and stuff are very difficult to get your hands on right now, especially in a state with as much construction as, as Texas. So they just transferred those dates to Sam Houston. So now that I've filibustered you on this whole thing, the uh, so I'm, I'm calling the first 12 days of those additional 20 dates. And last night was day six. So we're halfway through it. They run Wednesday, Thursday, Fridays at 645. And last night on a 10 race card, the first eight races all had an inquiry. So... <laughs> And the irony of it was that four of those were stakes races and they were $50,000 stakes races. So, I mean, they were legitimate, you know, they were, they yeah. were good horses that ran, there were grade one winners that ran. And then the ninth race was a two-year-old race where I think collectively they had about eight starts cleanest race of the night. So as it, <laughs> as it turns out, but there was even an inquiry, there was a disqualification of a, of a winner in one of those who was a two to five favorite. So yeah, it was a, it was a rambunctious bunch going down the straightaway and maybe it's those, those hot temperatures or the humidity that gets them going because we have plenty to offer. Oh yeah. This time of year, no doubt about it. We'll, we'll be listening for you on our local simulcast feed there. Uh, we are, we are going to talk about this pick six, I swear, but I have one more tangent I have to do with you first, which is, have you seen the many saints of Newark trailer at some point? I, I feel like we kind of need to do a 15 minute conversation about it. Not today, but, but I'm just curious if you've even seen it yet. Well, I have. Jonathan actually sent it to me, I believe, on Tuesday. And uh, I, I feel like he was on a website refreshing until it was out. And <laughs> he's very, very excited. And, and 
I am too. I mean, I, I can't wait. It was uh, actually had my, my dad and I watched it the next day and we're, I'm, I'm pumped. I mean, this has been something that, that I've, uh, I've been looking forward to for quite a while. It looks like it is, it is not going to be a disappointment. And I feel like anything that David Chase put there, there puts his name on and everybody associated with this, it's going to be great. I mean, how about Vera Farmiga as Livia? That was, great. yeah, I mean, that's, that's strong. So yeah, that's very, good casting. Uh, yeah, very, very exciting. It's going to be great for folks that don't know. Nick, one of the the USA's foremost Sopranos experts, who's not officially a TV critic. I think that's safe to say. And that's great that JK's into it. We'll pull him into that conversation too. But that will wait for another day because we have important 4th of July business with this big fat force out happening on Sunday. It kicks off in race number six at 309. I feel like that's perfect. If you're, you know, you can do some grilling before, some grilling after. You can have I feel like this is a good time of day right in the midst of our, our holiday celebrations to be betting on some horses. It, there's a lot of stakes in this sequence, but it kicks off with a starter allowance, three and up filly and mares going six on the dirt. Nick, kick us off. Who do you like here? How are we going to get this party started? You know, the favorite number one, Tam Char, comes in off a pretty impressive maiden win and looking at, at any any measurable speed figure, especially the, the buyer speed figure, she's a little bit of a standout. The, there are so many issues, though. The, this horse beat a, a relatively weak field, even for the class level. Did so with a with a pretty soft trip, even though she didn't get out of the gate that great. She did quickly kind of come to hand and and sat in a great spot. And she doesn't really have a ton of speed, so excuse me. The inside post is a bit of a worry, and how she can overcome potentially being stuck in behind horses is a concern. I felt like between she and Hufflepuff who followed up a really good second place finish beating the neck two starts back with a solid runner up finish again at this level that the winner would come from one of those two. I think that they both enter in, uh, in pretty strong form. I did take a look at the thoroughgraphs and saw that, uh, that Tam Char ran a five last time, which just towers over this field. And so that contributed to my thought that, you know, don't get too, don't make it too complicated. It looks as if the winner should come from one of these two. I would imagine if I was doing backups, um, I'd probably look towards the six and seven. My concern with Lambo Lady is that after a really promising debut, she's gone the wrong direction, came back against Tougher on June 13th and was eased and has not worked since. So I was a little concerned about that and, and wasn't sure if that would be enough for me to, to kind of tolerate and still be willing to use this horse. I see it similarly. I think the first two numbers I wrote down were the one for Tam Char and the two for Hufflepuff. But I had that same concern as you. I don't love the rail draw for a habitually slow breaker in a race where uh, there doesn't seem to be that much speed. Now, maybe they get the Tam Char breaking issue sorted out today and she shows more speed and just gallops because that's what she's supposed to do based on the numbers. So she's a clear A for me. Hufflepuff, I was going to use more as a B. Felt like had a weird trip in the last race and beat the horse that I'm actually going to end up putting on top. I definitely wanted some twos on the ticket. Incidentally, uh, Perrin gave me a quiz the other day, which Harry Potter house are you? And I got Hufflepuff. I have no idea what that means, but I thought I'd share it with the audience. I don't know if you're, you, you're in the Harry Potter generation, Nick, is this, should I be offended or is this a good thing? I'm in the Harry Potter generation. I just will admit that I did not read them. I, I <laughs> just not, my wife did. She's actually not here in, in room. I would ask her otherwise, but text um, yeah, me, so. text me later if, if, if I should be flattered or, or offended by the Hufflepuff designation, but the top pick for me in this spot, number five behind the couch, it's a bit of a guess, but I thought had a chance to prove the best possible speed. I think will be a, a, a good price and has some back races I thought were good enough. The last race was not very good, but that was slop. The form is working out okay. I'm going to have plenty of ones and twos, but I was going to throw the five in there for, for uh, a look as well. Let's move on to our second race in the sequence, race number seven. This is the beginning of our stakes action with the Jamila stakes going five on the turf for fillies and mares three and up and looked uh, to me that uh, kind of a boring one. Number eight introduced. I just thought it looked pretty obvious off the form and figures that license fee run came back fast, has produced a couple of next out winners. I don't think she'll be too far back and she's got some solid finish. I was also going to consider using the number six can the queen who I thought could get a perfect trip on or near the lead with a clean break. Nick, how do you see this one? 
Yeah, I mean, it starts and stops with introduced, right? It's it's uh, she's just kind of towers over them on paper and has faced so much tougher on a regular basis of late. So I would imagine that if she's able to kind of bring forth what we've seen lately, then she'll be pretty tough. I don't I don't envision her taking any kind of step backwards. I know Jorge Duarte has had a little bit of a slow 2021 so far, which is a little atypical of him. This is a barn that's entire setup is geared towards April through December. Basically, they're a pretty turf-heavy stable. Jorge Duarte, of course, is the was the heir apparent to uh, Alan Goldberg and has taken over yeah. the, the, all the JFB runners, which uh, is now known as Colts Next Stable, so I should get my my uh, everything right on the name end. Uh, you know, my concern here was it introduced as a horse that likes to make a move from off the pace. Does that become a bit of an issue? Can the Queen felt like the right horse to have uh, that could be forwardly placed? And so I, I wanted to include her as well. Um, I guess you could see a little bit of speed potentially from proper attire who showed speed last time in the stormy blues before fading late, but she just doesn't have a whole lot of stick to go with the speed. So I, I, I'd, I'd be more inclined to use her as a backup. If anything, I guess the 12 spun glass is a horse that has run well enough against better that she has to be given some consideration. I would probably use her no better than a, a C, but uh, it's a little interesting to me that her maiden win did come off a break of somewhat similar duration, and she may have needed just a little bit of time after a, a relatively busy winter at Gulfstream, and she did draw favorably on the far outside. All right, well, I'll make sure to include as a as a deeper backup, and that's a good point. I, I do like sometimes looking for those kind of patterns in races like this. When it comes to a favorite along the lines of introduced, when you're dealing with a, a force out scenario, do you feel more inclined or less inclined to use a heavy fave who still may be a, a little bit vulnerable? In other words, when the, when the stakes are higher, when you're theoretically getting more favorable economic conditions. How does that change your attitude about big, obvious favorites that you don't necessarily love? Um, I, I mean, it's, it, it's, I, <laughs> and we're not going <laughs> to, we're not going to get into the whole nebulous ticket structure conversation, of course, not, not too fervently, but um, I'm using horses that I think can win. You know, I'm not, I'm not attempting to, in a pick six sequence like this, there is as much survival to me as there is trying to create equity in each leg and introduced as a horse that you have to use in this race, because even though you might not have an overwhelming amount of confidence, the largest percentage of the time, this horse wins. So to me, you have to use her. And I think what you have to do is really be careful about how much you're going to help her. Because if you're, if you're using, you know, if you're using introduced can the queen spun glass and one other, you've now put yourself in a position where, you've dedicated a lot of capital in a race where you still feel pretty strongly like the favorite is going to win. So that to me is the biggest danger in everything. And you're just going to, eventually you're going to price yourself out of the market because you're going to spend too much money in races where you really don't have an opinion that necessitates you spending a lot of money. And there's two sense. ways you can, you can try to mitigate that. In my opinion, you can either have a much higher uh, betting amount running through the favorite on very similar tickets the rest of the way, or you can construct some tickets where getting a horse like introduced in, you know, maybe you only have it a couple of times beyond the base amount of the bet, but it unlocks some fuzzier thoughts, some more C type horses you have throughout the sequence. And, and I think if it's, it's a, it's a delicate balance to walk, but I think there's definitely a way to do it efficiently where you can try to have your cake and eat it too when it comes to runners like introduced in the seventh race on Sunday. Let's move on to race number eight. We've got uh, stakes action continuing here. The concern stakes for three-year-olds going six furlongs. Nick, we'll keep it with you. You know, this came up actually a very interesting race for just a field of six because you have Mighty Mischief, who was uh, an awfully impressive winner of the Chick Lang. Now, you know, let's be let's be honest about Preakness Day and the day before Preakness Day was not as as significant, but there was a pretty heavy rail bias on Black Eyed Susan Day. On Preakness Day, it was advantageous to be inside. There's no no denying that, and the Mighty Mischief certainly took advantage of it. But you know, here's a horse that in four races has basically not had the lead in in, in he's had the lead in, in every call but one, and got run down late by Aloha West on debut, um, and was highly regarded coming into that race was was training forwardly. So. The interesting thing here is that he's going to have to deal with Singlino, who's just to the outside of him. 
One thing about Mighty Mischief is that he has looked other horses in the eye early, gone quickly, and it's really done him no harm. Roderick really made out well at the post draw. And, you know, if you reverse these post positions, I would be very inclined to single Mighty Mischief. I am not uh, of the, the school of thought that being inside hurts speed. I don't know what this whole rail thing, where it started, but it's kind of silly to me. If speed horses, if they're going to do their thing, they're going to do it from anywhere. Obviously, the concern is that if you have a slow break and you're on the inside, it's a much bigger problem than if you're outside. It's going to make me use both of them, and, and I'm just going to go on from there because other than always in a hurry, who looks like he's a little bit too slow, none of these horses look like they really, none of the balance of the field looks like they really want to make up any ground. And so to me, Mighty Mischief and Roderick just look like they, uh, one of those two pretty much has to win, and I don't want to overcomplicate it, and we'll keep it relatively simple. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And Roderick going out as a first-time gelding, a little bit interesting there as well. I think <laughs> this may change depending on what I'm seeing from from the way that the rail is playing at Pimlico on the day where I feel like more often than not, the days I've been playing it, it's been, it's been neutral or good. And that's why at this point I'm okay. Just siding with mighty mischief as one who might be a good place to take a stand pace edge for the horse with the best numbers, fully recognizing that the last was flattered a little bit. I think you can deduct however many points you want for the bias. And you've still got who I think is probably the fastest horse unless Roderick takes that step up. I'm inclined to side with him. If it seems like the, the rail is tricky, um, I'm going to have to take a much more blended approach uh, between the one and the six. But from here, uh, th three races and, and three spots of agreement, really, uh, I think those are the right numbers, but I'll be heavily leaning on number one, mighty mischief in this spot. Let's move on to race number nine, Phillies and mares. Again, a mile and a 16th on the dirt for the Caesars wish stakes in this one and uh, two numbers i definitely wanted to to be having plenty of on the tickets not a ton clever to say about number eight landing zone just made all the sense in the world to me uh, facing an easier group than the last couple uh, should be able to get i think in a close enough to attacking spot and hopefully uh, be able to, to to make a nice run through the lane despite the apparent lack of pace Another one I want who'll also be uh, doing her best work late is the seven Mrs. Orb and very simple case there. Second time off the layoff with the Lasix back on. I probably want to get one runner involved too as a backup who's going to be closer to this pace. I hate the idea of taking two closers and only two closers in a spot like this. I like the way you described your approach to the pick six earlier, Nick, when you talked about it as a battle of attrition or, or, or a tournament or survive in advance more so than trying to pick up equity in each leg. And I'll, I'll feel like my chances are probably better of, of surviving. If I can figure out who the best speed is going to be, uh, maybe, uh, maybe that number will become obvious as you give your thoughts on race number nine. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, the balance of power in the race definitely feels like it shifted towards the outside with landing zone and Mrs. Orb, uh, both of whom have, even with Mrs. Orb running against New York bread, she's faced, I would say better competition throughout most of the last year, year and a half. Um, she's also great at stakes placed against open company, obviously in the turn back the alarm, finishing a good second to Royal flag. She was bested a few times by lucky move. Of course, the uh, recently retired and now in full uh, uh, mayor owned by our, our dear friend, Marshall Graham, you know, that who lucky move is in full to, right? Run happy, right? Run happy, yes. And it earned Marshall a free Tempur-Pedic mattress. So <laughs> don't tell Fantastic. anybody I said that. <laughs> Just between us. Don't I, spread that I around. Like Everybody's... I, yeah, I almost feel like I brokered that deal. But yeah, um, yes, yeah, so I'm in full to run happy. Uh, she got in just under the wire in the month of May. And uh, so very excited to, to see that in the future. And Mrs. Orb is a horse that really has been remarkably consistent. Mike Maselli is one of the more underrated conditioners in New York, in my opinion. His horses are, they perform well consistently. And um, I'm expecting her to run well. You know, the, the problem that you kind of ran into with regards to the pace situation is, you know, all, basically all six horses inside of these two main players, save Sweet Sammy D, have shown some speed, and, and Trolley Ride actually, have shown some speed at some point. So it's really going to be a matter of which of these shows enough speed to be dangerous. I think that of that group of six, the best horse is His Glory, who probably has the best speed. 
so I'm most inclined to use her. But I'm going to use, probably as a B, a horse that is going to be a gigantic price that I think there are a couple of little smart-ass angles on, and that's the sixth suggestive honor. I know this horse has run very poorly since coming to America, but I'll, I'll forgive the race in the slop. I don't know if she's really capable of going with stakes competition, sprinting. Now she's changing barns to a really high percentage stable that has really good numbers off of trainer changes. It looks like she's working very quickly, and I'm wondering if this is just an all-out send. And and maybe this is a horse that is going to just try and go you know, quick as she can, as far as she can, and, and might just be able to light up the tote board at a big price. If we get right in the other legs and this one wins this race, then obviously the value goes up exponentially. And so this was the one where I was going to try and inject a little bit of value at a huge price. I love it. I mean, I think that's a very, very clever, uh, clever case, smart ass or not on the six suggestive honor. I'm, I'll definitely be throwing in as a as a backup there as well in race number nine. Let's talk about race number 10 as we march along the light, the fuse stakes, six furlongs on the dirt for these three and up types. And I felt like I want to beat Yalpon in this race. And I, it, it may may well be to my detriment, but but I feel like you can make a real nice case for Chateau drawn inside to just end up being the best speed. I'm just not sure what we have in, in Yalpon anymore. I think this is the spot where I'm going to try to be bold, play Chateau to get the better of Yalpon on the front end, and then back up with number four, Lackey, who looks like the one to benefit if they go too fast up front. Am I going to regret taking on Yalpon in this spot, Nick? No, you know, I, I don't think so. I'm I'm very, I don't even know exactly what to do with Yopon. You know, the thing to me about him is that he was very game in breaking his maiden last year. He scored from just off the pace. And then we saw the way he was ridden and handled at Saratoga. And then obviously in the chick line, he was just better than that field. And it became almost apparent to me that the connections realized this horse may have won from a little bit off the pace in his debut, but he doesn't really want to come from off the pace. And and I and obviously I, I extol the virtues of utilizing speed and, and dictating terms to your rivals. So I don't have any, I don't, I'm not going to quibble with them being aggressive with Yopon. My point being, you really think he's going to sit outside Chateau and win this race? And I think the answer for you very clearly is no, if you're looking to take him on, because your expectation is that Chateau, who, uh, barring something very, very odd happening out of the gate, will be on the lead. I mean, Chateau is a horse that never misses the front end and happens to be in, in particularly good form right now. And, you know, one of the things that, that I've always liked about Chateau is that he is the, he is the speed horse's speed horse, right? He's at his best when he is allowed to run fast for as far as he can, just as he did in the Tom Fool. And I'm hopeful that, uh, that whomever they end up naming on him, he does not have a rider named as of right now, but whomever they, they do end up naming is very aggressive and looks to utilize all of that ample speed that Chateau possesses, I guess you have to include as a possibility what happens if these two just kill each other and and who's there to pick up the pieces. And the good thing is that I think that's one of the easiest questions in the race to answer, and the horse that you're supposed to use is, is Lackey, who looks like he's the next best horse, and he absolutely, you know, kind of a Maryland kingpin, run well at Pimlico, um, not going to hold a Maryland sprint against him, obviously, with the quality of that field, but he should be waiting in the wings should the, the battle really uh, come on early. And I think he makes for the third horse that you want to use. It's really to me a matter of how you structure those three. So if you're if you're bullish on Chateau, you may be willing to, to loan a Chateau and then use the other two with as, as backups or, or you may even want to pitch Yopon altogether. I don't you know, I don't have a problem with that. I don't have the courage to do that. <laughs> but uh, I would certainly, I would certainly be happy to to kind of focus on Chateau and Lackey and and maybe use Yopon as more of a backup. You know, I kind of mock Chateau on social media, which I know is uncharacteristic of me to mock anybody or anything. <laughs> um, uh, last year, because he looked so bad when he came back, and it, it really was nothing to do with Rob Atris. I, I don't, I wouldn't wish having to take some of these Jason Service horses on every on anybody. And you know, one of the things that. Uh, that Chateau has always had a problem with is finishing races. And I think they realized a little bit as he, as he got on in his time with Atris that you just really have to let him do his thing. You really have to let him go as fast as he wants. And that's when he's at his best. Because if you look at some of those time from U.S. pace figures going back to 2019, and I know you take everything that a horse did with Jason Service with a grain of salt, but he ran his best races when he went really fast early. And, and I don't think there's a chance in hell 
that Yopan can sit outside this horse and put up a one, you know, 135, 140 plus time from US early pace figure and be anywhere near the finish. I, I don't disagree. Now, I don't know. We talked about Harry Potter before. I, I don't know much about these houses and, and all that and what they mean. But I'm pretty sure, Nick, that if your social media persona had a house, it would be Slytherin. Yeah, I think that's I think that's about right. <laughs> Let's yeah. move on to our nightcap. We close things out with Maiden claiming 16s on the turf, going five furlongs. I will ask you, my friend, and I'm curious if we're going to – got to get one race here where we just completely disagree. Um, and if you completely disagree with me in this, you'd say it was straightforward and you just wanted the chalk. Yeah, no, that then we're on the same page because <laughs> there is no – yeah, there is nothing straightforward about this race at all. And uh, – I think it's really a matter of of just what you what you think is a possibility, and and then you're going to try and kind of backfit that into your budget because uh, I mean the favorite is probably going to be the ten gleaming sword. There is little to no turf pedigree here. What you're betting this horse based on is the fact that a a respected and high percentage trainer like Dale Capuano wanted to get this horse on the turf a couple of times and didn't get the opportunity to do so. But you know the dam was zero for twelve. wasn't much racehorse at all. She's dropped uh, five foals. None of them have won on the turf. None of them have won. Period. So it's it's a it's a really rough looking pedigree. The best pedigree in the race belongs to Leave Them Loaded, and she's an eight race maiden. Right? He's an eight race maiden. Right? So there's there's still you know it's not not anything particularly encouraging. Um, but I would I would end up using both. I don't have a any great deal of confidence in either one. Hair of the dog is a horse that's that's tra- changing trainers to Miguel Vera, who I was talking about before with my big long shot, and uh, and this horse has at least run winning races. So this is kind of a a horse that seemed obvious to me to use. He's got some speed. He'll be forwardly placed. The kind of of wild long shot type that that I would maybe try and find a way. Smitten enough on the far outside has plenty of speed. Ended up going long last time out. Got involved in a really hot pace. Understandably tired late. Now shortens up outside post, you know, maybe more of an outside speed type trip. This is one maybe to get on your ticket as a backup. He's going to be a big, big price. No, yeah, that's a very interesting idea. In terms of grading those four that you mentioned into A's and B's, do you, do you have any sense at this point, or is it just a more of a use as many as you can, equally no opinion kind of race? I, I'm going to I'm going to use the six, eight, and ten equally for sure. Um, the only other horse that I could see, including in that, is the three cracked a safe who didn't have the cleanest of trips last time either. I got into a little trouble around the half mile pole and um, and did take to the turf relatively well. So there's a little bit of upside there. And yeah, so I'd probably be three, six, eight, ten as A's, and I'd want to find a way to use the the one, the eleven, the fifteen or so as backups. I'm going to get that recorded for our plus listeners who are going to be looking at the grid. This is funny though because. I can tell you stories about four other horses that you didn't even mention. It's that, it's that kind of race for me. Let me see. Who do I want to make my my theoretical top pick in this spot? Something maybe with a little bit of upside. What about Virginia Fib uh, coming back second race? It, uh, no, third race off the long layoff, getting back onto the turf. It's just a guess, but looked like one who looking at numbers isn't far behind the best of these. And I felt like absolutely had a chance to potentially make an impact. Another one that I'll mention is the 13 flash is back. This horse at least showed some speed on the turf. When last seen Uh, comes here off a long layoff for a, a low percentage outfit, but I like the, uh, just looking at the pedigree, it feels like one that could uh, continue to show some ability on the green. Again, just a guess in a race where I'm looking for a double figure price to, uh, to to close this thing out. And then one other I'll mention is the 11 lost uncle who ha- is you know comparatively unexposed as a runner trying the turf for the first time. And the source was really bet on debut. I mean, to be bet to to be bet to two to one, and then coming up in a group like this trying something for the first time. That's a horse I don't want to get beat by. So I'm going to call it 7, 13, and 11. But to be clear, this is a spot where I think we both agree as many as you can afford. Is that safe to say? Yes, absolutely. No question about it. You want to be as as uh, thorough as possible trying to cover all the bases in this field because there are a lot of opportunities. 
All right, good stuff, Nick. Really appreciate you coming on the show. You're going to be back on these airwaves super, super duper quick because we've got not only Lone Star tomorrow, but I'm on taking the early part of the week on vacation next week, and you're going to be sitting in the chair hosting um, Rachel McLaughlin and Blake Jesse to talk about that awesome Wednesday Indiana Grand Card. So we hope people will will tune back in for that. Uh, is, is that uh, is Indiana Grand a place where you've had much success? I bet the Indiana Derby card last year, I think because it was during the week. And I do remember watching the Indiana Derby, the early part of the card with Pat Cummings two years ago when he and I had gone to Arlington for the contest. And then I, they, they were, Brilliant Racing was running the uh, asking for it that night and the race actually ran when i was on the flight home and he threw his rider at the start so it was kind of <laughs> kind of not what was expected but uh now i've dabbled in indiana grand i think I, i've definitely played some of the pick five carryovers but looking forward to it that should be fun we'll be with indiana's finest and yeah i'll be taping uh, lone star either later today or tomorrow i'm gonna have to hit up one of the guests that i promised to bring back because there's only two shows left lone star just has one week after this one they run tomorrow night and then uh, next week, the final three days, I think, are Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Well, we've appreciated all of your help with that project and all of your help today. Get well soon to Naomi Tucker. She was meant to join us today. She was actually going to be in my stead today, but uh, dealing with just a minor sore throat. Sounds like she'll be back on the airwaves later, but wanted to rest up those pipes. And we certainly understand that. Thanks also to our friends at the Maryland Jockey Club for sponsoring the show but thanks most of all to all of you, the listeners, who make these shows so much fun to do. This show's been a production of In The Money Media. Our business manager is Drew Coatney. Our chief creative officer is Jonathan Kinchin. I'm Peter Thomas Fornatal. May you win all your photos.